Yeah. So don't worry about it, but if it just yeah. goes natural. Right. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah, what? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to our February trauma informed workshop. As you all know, our topic this month is children exposure to domestic violence or the impacts of domestic violence on children. Today I feel really lucky and blessed to introduce you to three amazing leaders in our community here in Sacramento County. Some of you might recognize Elaine. She was here in October. Elaine is the executive director of a community for peace. She's been working in the social services field for 35 years, has a wealth of knowledge and experience. She is also a survivor and she will share parts of her story with you. I also want to announce that this week, Elaine was named Woman of the Year by Assemblyman Cooley. Yes. Well deserved, as you all know. And uh, next to Elaine, we have Dave Crop. Dave Crop was a sergeant for the family violence section of Sacramento PD for about 30 years. He also has a master's in social work. So as a police officer, as a detective, as a sergeant, he comes with a very unique perspective on family violence, kind of brings in that softer side. He's also the co-founder of the Domestic Violence Prevention Collaborative, which is where I met Dave many years ago when I worked at Weave. And then next to Dave, we have Robin Basinger. Robin is the director at a community for peace of the programs and operations, and she really co-founded that program with Elaine. So on that note, let's start with Elaine. Good morning, everyone. It's my honor, and, and welcome to a Friday, right? This is the thing you want to be trained on on Friday, right? All right, so we'll do our very best to kind of make this as, as informative and as lighthearted as we can be, because we tend to have to have a lot of humor in this business, right? Well, maybe you don't know that, but we have to have a lot of humor in this business. Otherwise, we'll be crying all the time, and we'll be freaked out all the time. It's my honor to be here. I was here in October. When we're going to do this presentation, the three of us are uh, have put together a um, customized training that we've just completed for our CPS. So this, this uh, PowerPoint that we use has actually been designed for us to train. At, last year we finished 700 uh, social workers, emergency response social workers. And so part of this um, is a grant that came through law enforcement that uh, put ourselves, uh, ACFP and law enforcement at Citrus Heights and CPS together. And part of it is to lower, in my, well this will be my opinion, in my opinion, okay, the primary goal is for us to place the child of the non-offending parent. That's the number one goal, is to get the CPS to under identify who's the non-offending parent, is to get law enforcement to identify who's the non-offending parent. Second part is to get everyone to understand what is the impact on children living in this environment. And the third part of it is to make some systemic changes. Right? Domestic violence is a social issue, and that's the first thing we have to remember because that's the thing that we don't get. We think it's a relationship issue. We think it's all these other things. It's not. It's a social issue. And so what I wanted to do today is to sort of give you big – how many of you were around in October for that training? Okay. And so for those of you who weren't, we're just going to kind of – I'm not going to repeat what Michelle did. I don't want to do that because I don't want to insult your intelligence. But I want to bring to you maybe a little bit – of an insider's perspective and a little bit more information so that you can understand the environment truly that a child is living in. And once you understand that environment, then you'll understand that impact a little more. That impact on the adult is also impacting the child. So the impact on the victim is also impacting the child. When you abuse a child's mother, you abuse a child. That's really what we're saying. And so we need to do that. But we also need to paint the picture and have you understand what is the motivation for an abuser? So why is an abuser doing this, right? And so we, I kind of want to give that overview there. So 
the other part of it is that we have some very innovative and progressive ways of looking at this issue over for Robert and I over our last 60 years to, together doing this co collectively work. And so what we want, we've done is we've been able to take information directly from victims and survivors and create very much culturally relevant and sensitive programs that fit what domestic violence survivors need. So let's just review again what we at least or up here, the three of us, mean by trauma-informed. To us, trauma-informed means that you really understand the impact of trauma across its lifespan. So trauma has a lot of uh, sessions, parts to it, all right? So it's not the one event that happens. It's everything before the event, and it's everything after the event. That's also part of that trauma. The second part of being trauma-informed is understanding the impact of trauma across the lifespan of the individual who has the trauma. So long after you've had the experience, you can be 20, 30, 40 years later, and something like 50 Shades of Grey can come on and trigger you all over again. And it's just as if it was yesterday. There are things that happen in the brain of every child in that environment before that child is even able to speak that changes the development of that child's brain and therefore the way that child will ever see the world, view the world, handle the world, deal with things. And once your brain is changed, what you really need to understand is it does not change back. You learn to adapt to it and um, overcompensate in some areas, maybe move around some areas, and there may be some things depending upon the severity of trauma and the chronic, uh, the frequency of that tra trauma and how long that trauma has lasted, where you may actually have really gaps that never get filled in. Right? And so even last night in advocate training, I was saying to some folks, I'm like, look, you're not here to heal your memories. You're here to heal the impact of what has happened to you because that's what's still messing with your life. The impact is what's messing with your life. So before we go any further, I think the other thing that when I come back at the very beginning to say this is a social issue, the reason I say that is because I want you to understand that domestic violence before 1981 was not illegal in our country. So we actually had a law on the books that said men have the right to beat their wives and their children as long as they use a weapon no larger than the size of their thumb until 1981. I want you to understand that spousal rape was not against the law until 1993. I want you to also understand, as Robin will tell you, that strangulation just became a felony 1 January 2012. So we are talking about a social issue, yes, it's a trip, huh? It's a social issue. And, and what we don't understand is what is the impact. So when you're talking about something that was actually legal, all right, you got a whole society and culture change here has to have to happen in the head, right? Just in the same way that slavery was once legal in our country, we're still dealing with crap with that. Y'all get that? We're still dealing with it generations later. We're still dealing with it. That's historical trauma, too. And that's impact of trauma, too. So as a culture, as a society, as a nation, as a human tribe, we have to understand all of these contribute to this issue. So domestic violence, as you will find out and will be more articulate today, is so not about somebody's anger. It's so not about somebody losing control. It's so not about those things. It's about one thing and one thing only. It's about power and control. So I want to introduce to you um, Robin Basinger. She's our Director of Programs and Operations. Robin and I have been together for about 25 years now, and we were hired by the City of Citrus Heights. We have a consulting firm in for Fair Oaks. And we were hired to resurrect this agency because Community for Peace used to be called the Domestic Violence Intervention Center. And so we came there. I have my little visions and ideas, and she makes it all happen. Uh, and develops the programs and trains the people and lets everything roll. We have some very innovative and unique programs that are not done anywhere else in California and some that are unique to the, to the United States. And all of these have been created based on what survivors needed, what some of us, as, and myself as a survivor, 
wished I would have had, what I hoped my mother could have had, and the things that actually really did work for us. Um, so our agency, just to briefly tell you that, is, is split into two parts. So both directors have equal authority in our agency. We're shared leadership. Robin runs the whole direct services and crisis services and works directly with clients. I'm the social change agent, so I go and seek funding and opportunities to partner with systems that actually are barriers to victims getting services. So I'm looking for law enforcement partners. I'm looking for CPS partners. I go and find my faith community because these are all the places where victims need to go and these are the places that need to be the most educated about this issue. So I'm grateful to be here with you all because you're part of that system and, and that you have an openness and a willingness to also lower the barriers so we can all work together to make your jobs less frustrating because working with victims is not an easy thing. I'm the first to tell you. It's not an easy thing. Of course, I will also say it's harder being a victim, just a sidebar. All right? So we're going to do that. We like questions, and so we like you to ask the questions that mean something to you because it's got to grow corn, as my native self says. You've got to grow some corn, meaning it's got to be practical. You've got to use this thing. We don't want this to be theoretical. Robin and I tend to be, you know, pretty down here on the earth, so I don't want to freak anybody out, but we try to be keep our language clean. We understand we're in the state, but if we were to train in the way we train, it would be like the real thing. You know what I'm saying? Because we want you to understand what that child is hearing. We want you to understand what that child is feeling. So sometimes we can get a little intense, so if that slips out, even though we're trying to be, you know chill around here, right? We're trying, to, we're trying to do this in a good diplomatic way, but sometimes that thing that slides out. And I just want you to understand that that's it about. I also want to say this. I know that domestic violence is an epidemic in our nation, that there are, we are third, second, third, and fourth generation, all right? Some of this is going to touch you. And for some of us in here, we've lived that life. So I want you to understand that you can take this moment to also heal your trauma. Because one of the hard things about survivors is not only is it hard for us to tell the truth, it's even harder for us to hear it again in someone else. So take this moment and let that be healing for you too. Take a breath through it all. And if it gets too intense for you, don't walk out this room because that would be like running away from it. Just breathe deeper. All right? Because it's not happening to you right now. And you are absolutely safe. And this is something you're going to take this moment. This is how I would do trauma informed when we're training in our advocate training. I tell them, take a breath. It's supposed to touch you. This is a healing moment. It's supposed to touch you. It happens to all of us. Every 30 seconds, one in three women, one in four boys, men, is supposed to touch us in here. All right? So don't let that get in your way. Just power on through, and you'll be fine tonight. All right? Well, it's not tonight. It's a CCI. I was training from tonight. I'm already there tonight. All righty. This morning. All right. So let me turn this over to Robin, and we'll just kind of do a quick overview of DV from our perspective and then roll right into our, our kid piece. All right? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I am... Um, I'm here to with the task of giving you that foundation, that reminder about what DV is, and I know that you know what it is because you've been in this room before and you've been taught that. Um, but we want to highlight some things so that when Dave comes up and he really gets into children exposed to DV, it makes a little bit more sense. It's a little bit more comprehensive. Before we get going, I just want to talk about where I will be coming from in some of these examples. As Elaine said, we uh, at a Community for Peace have created some innovative programs and the most innovative and progressive program that we have is called our DVERT Team First Response, DVERT, D-V-R-T, an acronym for Domestic Violence Response Team. Let me be very clear, just about every domestic violence provider has a DVERT team. Ours is different in that it is a first responder team and as far as we're understanding, we're the only one in the nation that does this, which is we have a cubicle at the police station. Lots of agencies have that. We go into briefing. We give domestic violence reports. We give domestic violence training. I think everybody does that too, but here's where we're a little bit different. After briefing, we put on a different kind of uniform and a radio and grab some flashlights, and then we go on patrol with our law enforcement partner. And we will go on patrol for eight 12-hour shifts whatever that shift is for the day, with the 
mission of responding to the full spectrum of domestic violence, family violence, and sexual assault. And I say full spectrum because it may not be a felony assault that we roll to. It might be a child exchange gone wrong. Those are a lot of our calls, but it might be a felony. It might be a verbal. And so the power of that is that you have a highly trained domestic violence counselor right there on scene right there. So as, as law enforcement rolls up, we're right there with them. We're in the front seat of that car. And so this has been a remarkable program for us, and I'll just tell you quickly why. Before we had this program, law enforcement would go to the scene, they would interview, and they would do whatever it is that they needed to do. Then once they identified that victim, they would hand the victim what we call a We Care card. So it has shelter information, uh, crisis line information, etc. Well, we did stats on that, and when law enforcement would hand them a card, about less than 10% of the time, that victim would go into our agency for services. Okay, that's okay, but we were really hoping for a lot more. Once we got our Devert First Responder program going on, and a counselor would touch and interview and have time with that victim to do crisis counseling right there on the scene, our numbers have been as high as 70% of the time those victims and families would come into the agency for services. And speaking from a place of advocacy, that's a touchdown for us because that's us changing families' lives, really intervening and educating. And as you will see, education, domestic violence education, is the key to healing for both victims and offenders. Here we go. First thing that we need to do is we need to remind ourselves about all of the myths in our culture about this issue. So many times when it comes to this issue in our culture, we talk about it and go, well, don't worry about it because she was never hit or I was never hit. So we think domestic violence is just about hitting and nothing could be further th from the truth. But here are some of our biggest myths. This is about uh, maybe the offender losing control. Offenders, abusers do not lose control. They're in very much control and I'll give you some examples in a little bit here of that. Or that they just need anger management or if he wouldn't drink there wouldn't be a problem. This is a really big myth that perpetuates in our culture that things like losing a job or drinking are causes of domestic violence and no they are not causes of domestic violence. They're triggers. So yes, it can make things escalate or make things happen in that time and point, but they are not the cause of domestic violence. If they could get into marriage counseling, so this is one of our number one myths in terms of solutions out there. No, marriage counseling will not fix domestic violence because it's not a marriage problem about, well, we just need to communicate better. It is much more than that. As Elaine said, it is about power and control. If she would try harder, we always hear that. We're always trying to put a lot of blame on that victim. Well, you know, if she were a better cook or she'd try harder or keep a cleaner house or she could bring in more money if she were a better parent, things like that, then he wouldn't get upset and he wouldn't hurt her. Big myths, big myths. And we're really, again, part of our problem in our culture is putting all of this blame and expectation and responsibility on the victim. So one of the things that we hear a lot in our culture is, why doesn't she, why doesn't she just leave? That's kind of sometimes our first question that we ask when we're talking about this issue. We need to turn that around and go, why does he hit? Why does he abuse? Why, why is that happening? That's what we need to do. Uh, here's that number one myth, she's never been hit so it's not DV. That's, that's true, truly a myth. We're going to talk about that in a minute. DV is much more than physical. Uh, maybe if they talk to their minister, you know what, that's always a good idea to talk to your minister, but we should not do that with the expectation, number one, that the minister understands the issue comprehensively. Okay, it's always good to get a higher power perspective, but we cannot have that attachment that that minister knows that issue comprehensively. And as you will see here in a minute, doctors, uh, counselors, marriage family therapists don't even understand the issue comprehensively much of the time. Uh, middle and upper class women do not get battered as frequently as lower class. Big, big myth. They may not go to shelters as often. They may not come into a DV provider as often. They may not even call the crisis line as often. But this is a fair social issue and it does touch everyone. At our agency, uh, we do see uh, very affluent 
folks come in. So we have people who are professors who are victims, attorneys who are victims, politicians' wives who are victims. So this is a very fair issue. We can't just be putting this and shoving and saying that this is a lower class issue. It's really not accurate, really not fair. Okay, and once a battered woman, always a battered woman, and that is very false. Yes, you can heal from this and you can move on. But again, a key, and you will hear me be very adamant about this over and over, is that victims must receive the right kind of support in order to get out of the issue. That support, first and foremost, needs to be domestic violence education and domestic violence counseling. Somewhere in our movement, I believe in the late 80s and 90s, we started to bypass DV counseling and put more women into therapy and we help to perpetuate some problems there. DV counseling. So I'm not saying anything about minimizing therapy. We need therapists. We need therapy uh, for victims. But they really need to have that education and that, that specific kind of counseling. OK. Here's what domestic violence is. It is a pattern. And that's the big word you're going to hear over and over today of assaultive and coercive behaviors, including physical, psychological, and sexual attacks that adults or adolescents use against their intimate partners. This is a behavioral definition. And I want you, I'm focusing on that with you for a moment because when Dave gets up here and he talks about law enforcement perspective, law enforcement's definition of domestic violence has to be and is very different than the behavioral. And so that makes a difference on how and when, therefore, um, law enforcement responds, what they do. But it also makes a difference to the victim when they recognize somewhere in there that there's a difference between an advocate and a counselor in law enforcement and uh, why aren't they doing anything. Well, we're working off of different definitions and we're trying to get them um, to, to interconnect in a, in a good and healthy way. Can I add in your yes, minute? Please. One of the things I think that's also really, really important when you think about this pattern and the difference between a criminal definition, because you guys are all about the crime, right? And a behavioral definition is when when survivors, victims have to negotiate a system and they have to navigate a system, it's all these systems are still coming off of that criminal definition. So think about survivors who have to go through mediation. The mediator needs to know the behavioral definition, not the criminal one because they're mediating behavior. Get what I'm saying? And so there is a very big difference. And to empower a survivor by giving her the behavioral definition, and one of the things that we strive to do is to have our survivors, when they go to court, um, ask those mediators those questions. Do you know the behavioral definition of domestic violence? Because you're going to mediate behavior, not the crime. You see? And if you do not have that education understanding, I have a right to ask for another mediator someone who is knowledgeable, someone who does have understanding. We want to empower victims to know this stuff. So I think that's important. And then the last thing I want to say just before you continue is when we talk about this being um, why it had to be a criminal thing first, because it was legal, right? So the first thing you got to do is pass a law to make it illegal. And that's why that's where people started and some people ended. We passed the law. And we all know that you just got to pass a law, everything changes. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's here's some important things about domestic violence. We need to understand that it is a repetitive pattern, not an incident. And again, here's a difference between um, DV providers in our perspective and law enforcement. Law enforcement rolls up. We're dealing with an incident. So even when we get police reports, we see the incident, but we're seeing it in the bigger context. The incident is sort of like the microcosm. The pattern is the macrocosm. So for us as counselors and therapists and advocates, we see it as a pattern, and, in, and indeed that's what it is. Now, what that also does then is it creates an environment. And so when we look at domestic violence, we're not just looking at the individuals, we're looking at the the, the environment that the individuals make. So one of the things that is really wonderful about the evolution of law enforcement, especially for us in Citrus Heights, is that prior to our uh, partnership, they used to focus on, here we're going to a DV incident, were kids present during the incident? And so they'd go, no, don't worry about it. The kids were at the neighbors or the kids were in the back room sleeping. So they weren't here in the living room during the incident, so don't worry about it. Now it has evolved to 
are there children in the household, which is much more accurate and complete and important for us. Okay, and so I've already covered this. This, this happens in every uh, sector of our society. So uh, as Elaine alluded to earlier, here we go. This is what it is about. Domestic violence is about someone having power and control over you. So when we, again, think about this issue in our culture, we think about it being physical. If I'm an abuser, I'm just going to cut to the chase because my time is very limited here. If I'm an abuser, I want one thing. And I only need one thing to have power and control over you. And that is to be inside your mind. That's all I need. If I'm an abuser, my intention is to have control over your mind. What you think, what you believe, your attitudes, your attitudes about yourself, your attitudes about life and children and everything. I progress then and I start to have power and control over everything else but once I have your mind everything else becomes easier because the cherry on the cake is I'm gonna have control over your mind but you're gonna think that it's your idea whatever I put in there I'm gonna get you to think it's your idea because I'm gonna change the way you think so I have many many stories of one woman who was um, a real I'll just use this in terms of uh, uh, she was a Democrat. She was groomed by someone and soon after, two months only, she became a staunch right-wing Republican. And of course that's her right, but then she thought it was her idea. But that was his position all along and that's where he wanted her because that was easier for him to have control over her. So changing again the way that she thought about her life, even her political affiliation. So this is what abusers want. They want control over your mind, your beliefs, your attitude, your likes, your thoughts, your actions, your emotions. If I have control over your mind, I can make you feel something. So many times when I would counsel abusers, they'd say, you know what's what I like about being an abuser is I can make her look, I can make her I can make her cry if I want to, I can make her hysterical if I want to, I can make her happy if I want to. That's the ultimate power and control. They won't allow you to even watch the TV or listen to a radio show or whatever it is that you your personal liberties are taken away slowly and surely by somebody who has an intent to have power and control over you. Many victims can't even uh, decide on whether they want to go to work or not but and that seems like okay we can get that. Some victims don't even have a choice when they can use the bathroom. That's how much power and control many abusers have over victims. So part of our cultural problem here is that we lack a unified training system about domestic violence. We, we, we all are trying to teach domestic violence, but we're all doing it in very various ways. But more importantly, this issue is misidentified and misunderstood by people who should know it the best. So law enforcement, doctors, nurses, probation, principals, teachers, firefighters, EMTs, uh, therapists, drug and alcohol counselors. If you think about grad school, uh, you maybe get a chapter on DV in grad school if you're going for your masters. It's changing, but again, we're not being thorough enough in, in our training of folks, so we're missing the mark a lot out here in our culture. We're missing the mark to be able to respond to a victim. We're missing the mark in the, in the way of being able to say to an offender, hey, you got to take some accountability, you got to be responsible here. So addressing the issue superficially from myths, believing that it's one dimensional, not understanding victim response, we'll get into a little bit of, about that, and not understanding abuser tactics, and not understanding the impact to children. Again, and Dave will really extrapolate on this, but when I, w when I was creating Devert First Response, I would do all of the patrols for the first eight months because I was developing uh, the program. So I was thinking, okay, you know, this isn't going to be, can you go back to the next slide for me? This isn't going to be um, the other way. There you go. This isn't going to be. Uh, it'll be interesting because I've been in the movement for a long time. So it was interesting to me to see. Well, we have all of these myths out here that I was hoping that we'd evolve from. No. One of the first calls I went to was the literal textbook thing of uh, was a verbal, and the lady was very frustrated, a little bit hysterical because of this verbal that had gone on. The offender had left. GOA gone on arrival uh, during interviews. Ma'am, are there? 
children, yes, we have two babies, we have twin boys, but don't worry because they're in the back room sleeping. And so they're not impacted at all. And so that's our emphasis here today is that they can be sleeping, but they are still part of that environment and they are still impacted. Their brain development is impacted. So we really have to take a, a greater understanding of this issue. Okay. Do you want to try to take this? One. All right. So when we when we think about the evolution of how we've been dealing with domestic violence, you know, we went through the idea that it's mental illness, so we made it a mental health issue. Um, I think you feel pretty mentally ill, but I don't really know that that's so. And here's why: how we figured this out. You know that when you have a mental illness, you're sort of mentally ill everywhere. You know what I mean, everybody sort of can notice. When you're in domestic violence, that batterer has so much control that that batterer does not appear to be out of control anywhere else. It's very deliberate and intentional. So that's when we figured out, well, can't be mental illness thing because you're pretty whacked everywhere when you are, right? Okay, so we went there. Then we decided we had to figure out it had to be anger management. And I'll just say sidebar 36 years later, anger management's for those of us who have to work with them. Okay, we need it. We're frustrated. We need it, okay? And we, we thought, okay, it's a loss of control. No, it's not. It's very deliberate and intentional. All I had to do is look at the Ray Rice video, and you'll see it's very deliberate and intentional because he was absolutely in control till the elevator doors closed. I'm talking about you have control, okay? So we know now that our, constant under, our, our current understanding of domestic violence is that it is a learned behavior. How do we learn behavior? Well, interesting. When you're a kid you learn your behavior from your observation. So you, you're checking out what's going on around you, right? So you see who has power, who doesn't have power, what works, what doesn't work. The observation is one way we learn. We also learn from our own experiences what works, what doesn't work, right? If I hear all the time, shut the F up, shut the F up, shut the F up, I get a hit and then, and then it's quiet, it kind of works. When people ask me, why do they do that? Because it works. Okay, you have power and control over someone, you need them to do whatever you want to, and then they do it, it works. So you learn from experience, especially male children learn that. Belief systems, and belief systems not only in the family, but we have cultural belief systems about the roles, the gender roles, male-female roles. We have cultural belief systems around how you deal with anger or you don't. We have cultural belief systems about topics we can talk about and topics we can't talk about and who we're supposed to tell it to. All right? So we have a lot of those cultural taboos. We also get it from our culture, I mean our families, our communities, and one of the ways that as a survivor and as a child survivor that I relate to in most survivors is the response people give you if you were trying to hint something was going on. And if that first response is, well, what did you do, then you know you're not telling nobody anything after that. Because that just tells you, the survivor, you don't get it. And if you don't get it, I am not risking saying the rest of this, where you're going to turn around and use it against me because that's my experience in my home as a child, and it's my experience as an adult. So I learn how to do this. I learn it from my peer groups, right? We go to family and their friends, and they say, you know, I can tell you really clear this way, you know that it's hard to find a man. After you, you know, it's hard to get divorced and be a single woman and, and, and find a man. You know, well, you know he's at least bringing home the paycheck. At least he's doing that. There's a lot of men not even doing that, you know. So you got friends and family tell you that. Or they tell you, you know, now look, everybody has an argument. Just, you know, just forgive. Just let it go. It's hard out here in this world. How are you going to do this by yourself? You learn that too. That okay, then I don't even have a support system if I were to do something. And I learned that very early in my first marriage, in the first day going down the aisle, when my abusive father said to me, don't fuck this up. So already going down the aisle, I already know that anything happens in this relationship, it's going to be me. So I knew it was not a good one in the first two months, but it took me 16 years to get free. Okay. I knew it already, but that kept playing on my head, friends and family, don't mess this up, Elaine. So already I was taking the, the responsibility. Well, if I am a child, all right, allegedly sleeping in the other room, because I don't know about you, 
But as a child survivor, you don't sleep through stuff. Me and Dave talk about how we still have a hard time sleeping. You know, I'm 62 years old. When I can sleep six hours, I'm thinking, whoa, am I dead or what? Because I'm not getting up to have to do perimeter check. Or I'm not like, well, wait, I slept too long. Am I dead? Am I dying? What's going on? Because I think i got to do that 90-minute thing. All right? And so it's, it's a score for me when I can go past 90 minutes. Right? Because that's the way my brain was changed. And it's the way I learned to adapt. All right? In that way. So when I'm a child, I'm learning. I'm learning exactly how to have power. I'm learning exactly how to have control. I'm learning how to manipulate to get what I need. I'm learning all that. And all I have to do is hear it. I don't even have to see it. I just need to hear it. And because I'm hearing it every day, it's the pattern, it's the environment, and I'm going to learn it much faster because I'm a child. I got a sponge for a brain. I'm going to take it all in. This is where we, I just want to highlight this right here. So, again, there are many different types of abuses, and I know that all of you had a DV training, so I'm trying to really move through this quickly. But there are some things, again, we want to set up and, and we want to remember with this issue. So there are different types of abuses, but I want you to understand is that three-quarters of this issue is is that offender moving and reaching into that mind and changing that mind and that all abuses impact that victim's psychology and emotions and so if you think about for instance if I'm picking on you for a moment and I'm like you know why are you wearing that you know why are you shaving like that why you got that hair color and why why are you sitting like that and I'm poking at you 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 pretty soon that's really annoying right and so you're gonna do some things you're gonna like stop it you're gonna try to walk away but I'm gonna keep following you and I'm gonna keep poking at you and I'm gonna keep poking at you and like why don't you make more money why don't you ask for a raise why don't you get a better job you know well you know your mom is stupid well you know your sister's stupid you know your brother's a, a low life and you know your family you need to stay away from your family and I'm poking at you 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 you know sooner or later you're like wow get the F away from me and so you're gonna turn in retaliation and so that motivation is gonna be about get away from me and so this is where some victims will fight back and their intention is not to have power and control over that person their intention is to have power and control over the situation get off of me get away from me but again if I'm poking at you poking at you and let's say that I'm doing this you know for a month as we're dating poking at you poking at you poking at you or for the first year of marriage poking at you poking at you poking at you I'm changing your psychology and I'm creating emotion in you and so you become like a puppet again so that I can control you so if I can control you I feel really good about my life right now because I got control over somebody I may not feel like I have control over my job I may not feel like I have control over the government or circumstances or my family but I can have control over you and one way I'm gonna do that is to break you down break you down break you down and so many times we hear victims as we'll go to the next few we just add in right here so that part if you're a child learning that all right, you as a child, you're going to see that that kind of poking and poking and poking and getting a reaction is pretty powerful. Look what you could do to somebody. Look what you can make them do. And look how calm this other person looks and look how hysterical the other person looks. Wow, I I'm going I want to be like that one over there. Right? But the other thing is then I grow up, I also understand this that if as a child I'm looking at this I'm also as a child trying to figure out how to control that situation survivors victims always try to control every situation they are in not a person they're not trying to control you they're not trying to manipulate you they're trying to control the situation they have to even be in with you and so a part of how I control that is I don't always tell the truth. I tell it in my timing. I tell it in my way. I try to see, I try to push you to see what you're going to, how you're going to react. I'm a child who saw that and I learned that. And so I grow up now. I have a more sophisticated way of doing it. 
So we use verbal violence as an example. So when we think about verbal violence, we think about somebody yelling. So again, go on, I'm going to use divert first response as an example. When we're in the patrol car and we're about to respond to a scene, we see things on the board and we also hear it in our ear through dispatch. And so more times than not, the RP, the reporting party, is not the victim. A lot of times the reporting party party is actually the offender or the abuser setting it up so that she's going to look crazy. A lot of times the reporting party is the neighbor because they hear yelling. So we always think about yelling and screaming as part of domestic violence, but I want you to understand something else. I can use my voice just like this, and it can be just as intimidating. And, it, and you can have an association with this voice. Here's what it is. It's just like this. Let's say that I'm an offender and I have um, my victim here and we have a kid and we have a CPS meeting tomorrow. Well, I need to establish extra power and control tonight so that tomorrow I can make sure that I can manipulate easily tomorrow as well. So if she's talking and talking and talking and that annoys the crap out of me as an offender and abuser and I tell her to shut the F up, shut the F up, shut the F up, I scream at her and she doesn't respond, I have to escalate, shut the F up, shut the, and I have to get louder, louder and she doesn't respond so I have to escalate. So now I'm just going to put my hand on her throat. Now I have her attention and then I say, Please just shut the fuck up. Then tomorrow when we go to CPS and she's nervous, I say, put the baby down right here. And I use that same voice. Now she has an association. To be in power and control does not have to be like this, does not have to be loud. Remember that that offender, that abuser, knows exactly what they're doing. There are so many times we've rolled up to a scene and the neighbors come out and they go, this is horrible. We hear him yelling. Every, it's chaotic. We hear him. Uh, we hear her yelling, no, don't, please don't. Uh, she comes out. She's bloody. She's everything. But he also comes out and says, hey, thanks for coming. I, uh, I was going to call you because I think that she's 5150 and I need help. Can you get her to the ER because she needs a mental evaluation? Calm, cool collected, because that's what offenders do. The other side of that is that then the victim, survivor, who's living in this environment, right, is actually starting to doubt herself. So she's starting to doubt whether she's making right decisions. She's starting to doubt whether she should say something or not. She's looking directly and looking for hints about things, right? As a child who grew up in it, who learned this, Children who are living in a domestic violence environment are more hypersensitive and more hypervigilant because they have to be. And so we learn, I learned as a small little girl, how to read somebody's eyeballs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If their little eye twitches or the little eyebrow goes up or how intense you're looking at something or how quickly you can just slightly move your head and then I know what that means. It's really interesting sometimes when I'm sitting with um, you know our advocates and some of who are survivors and we've done our good measure of healing and move through some of these things that's why we've come back to share but it is funny that we can be in a training and we can just kind of give a look and we all know what that means. So we're still using our little skills as, that we learned as children. Now we're doing the nonverbal communication. It's working out well. We don't have to look really crummy in the middle of an audience. But what I'm also wanting you to understand is I'm so sensitive to your energy that if you just twitch, I know it. And so I'm going to grow that up now as an adult, huh? And as a victim, I'm going to be Eve, that same sensitivity. So you don't have to yell anymore. You can give me a look, and I'll know what that means. So, so I can be sitting right in front of you or sitting with CPS or with my therapist or with that, and that look is shutting me down right there. Right? Now, the weird thing is you all are in the system, and you don't know all this, and you just might have something in your eye one day, and that victim's looking at you like, why are you giving me that look? And now I'm shutting down. Know what I'm saying? Because 
you don't understand that that's where they're zooming in and every child is doing the same thing. And then you take that as a child, grow it up, you got a skill base. You, 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 you've honed that skill. And so now it becomes part of you. And you do not understand that that's something that came from your exposure. Well, let me just, uh, why don't you go to where you want me to go and I'll, uh, I'll kind of weave everything in. Okay, but as, well, again, when we talk about if I'm an offender or an abuser, I want your mind. So again, some of the very big tactics that we talk about are um, crazy making tactics, but I also want to say this. If I'm an offender, one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a threat and I have to follow through on some threats so that the future threats you have an association and I may not have to follow through on those things. So I might threaten that I'm going to hurt the pet and then I do hurt the pet. I might threaten that I'm going to take all the money and then I take all the money. I might threaten that I'm going to take the kid and I'm going to go out of state but I'm really going to go to my mom's down the street. I'm going to follow through because it's going to create a reaction and an association and so then as things escalate I don't have to put myself out, I can just give a threat and have power and control over you. One of the one of the things that um, where are you going, Lainey? Okay. One of the things that um, uh, abusers really are, again are wanting to do is make that victim seem crazy. So they might take it all the way to where they get 5150, where they go into uh, law enforcement, takes them to the hospital, and the, uh, they do the mental eval, and yes, now they're in a county for a couple of weeks because. So this issue makes people think that they're crazy, but they're not crazy, they're being played with. So many stories, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, she works, he knows that she works, so he comes in through the screen of her bedroom window every day and he does things like this, just goes in her refrigerator and just moves some things around. And then he'll come in the next day and do the same thing. And then the third day he'll come and he'll move something on the coffee table. Then they'll have a date and she'll go, man, I thought I had milk. Or I thought I put my, my, my magazine here. And he'll say things that'll suggest to her that she's going crazy. Like, well, Mel, you know, um, are you sure? You know, because you seem kind of out of it today. Or you seem a little, like, foggy or something. Or, yeah, I've noticed that you haven't been real, like, sharp lately. And so what does that do? Now it starts her questioning herself. And when you question yourself, if you've ever had that experience about any area of your life, what happens is your esteem goes down. And then you can't really step up or stand up for yourself. And then it's easy, you're, you're easier to manipulate by suggestion. Well, you know, you're not sharp, so um, maybe we should just do this. Or um, maybe you don't go to work. Or give me your, your ATM card and I'll go get what you need kind of a thing. So setting up now that you need to give me your ATM card, your PIN number, I got to know where your bank is. One thing always leads to another. Quickly here, so we have emotional and psychological. All abuses have impact the psychology and the emotions. So quickly on physical abuse because that's what we all think it is. And yes, when it escalates, okay, and it gets to physical abuse, the, the important thing that I will quickly mention here is this from spitting to strangulation, but strangulation is a very, very serious thing. If I strangle you, huh, whether you black out or not, there's still a potential within a 48-hour period that you could die. Lots of things could happen. You can All of this stuff, and the tissue in here can swell, pieces of cartilage can come off. So sometimes, you know, when a victim has had enough and they call and they say, hey, I need to get out. Do you have shelter? Do you have a bed? Yes, we have a bed. Tell us what happened. Well, I was choked because that's what everybody on the outside will call it, choked. And some of them are choked. Some of them do have those experiences where something is being stuffed down their throat like socks or lingerie. But when we're talking about what they're talking about, it's really called strangulation on the outside. Either I might use my hands, I might use rope, I might use a scarf, I might use a bra, I might use something. So she says, hey, I've been strangled. Yes, we have a bed for you, but you got to go to the emergency room because this is how serious it is. But I didn't black out. I just kind of got dizzy. It doesn't matter, honey. you got to go to the ER. This is a serious, serious issue. About 85, 80% of the, the victims that walk in through our agency have been strangled at least once. And out of that, probably about 95% have been strangled repeatedly.
Some of them say, I can't even tell you how many times I've been strangled. This is very serious. So serious because there is no more physical escalation after strangulation. The, the only place to go after that is homicide, is murder. And once I have established the use of strangulation as an offender, I'm not going to give that up. So when a victim says, okay, well, it only happened once, and I don't think it's going to happen again, if I'm an offender and I have that ultimate power through making you shut up, I can make you black out, I am not giving that up. So we have to understand that when victims have been strangled, this has been intense intense abuse and we need to take this seriously and it was not until January 1st 2012 that strangulation became a felony so everybody in the movement said oh thank goodness finally because this is such a severe um, experience for victims to have highlighting that in these cases um, at, the, at least through our office 50 percent of these women who had strangulation children were pregnant so they watched that happen We've had two and three year olds who actually interrupted their mothers being strangled, right? And so what happens because it's learned behavior, when they get into the shelter and that immediate danger is left, so here's trauma informed, we know within 72 hours, I was saying this in advocate training last night, when our kids come in to the shelter, they're like the, the angel children, you know, for the first 48 hours. Oh, they're so, you're like, how could anyone? This is a lovely child. I want to be around this kid. On the 72nd hour, <laughs> you know, when them kids feel safe, you're like, what happened to this kid? All right? <laughs> what happened to this child? So we had a woman come into the shelter. She had a 3-year-old and a 10-month-old. And in that 72nd hour, that child was up on that mother's lap strangling the mother and then got off the mother's lap and strangled the 10-month-old because you learn this behavior and there is no bigger ultimate control than strangling someone. Well, this will be my last part here. Okay, so uh, just we need to note this because this is important and we don't usually um, merge this in with domestic violence and not enough. Um, ACFP, we do a lot of our own studies, so this is how I will explain this. Um, when folks come in, they have to do an intake sheet, and it's, a, it's an assessment. And yes, it seems like it's kind of long, but it's a lot of check boxes because it's hard sometimes for a victim to articulate exactly what has happened to them. It's easier for them to read it and then check a box. So the last question is about sexual abuse. And so for some of the examples, I'll just give you quick, have sex with others of his choosing, makes her have sex when she doesn't want to, or forces or coerces her to take drugs. Many, many, many victims are drugged in order to achieve cooperation. Many victims are drugged in order to achieve cooperation, especially when we're opening up the sexual door. So in our study, 80% of these folks, we did this study, 80% checked off the box, no sexual abuse. Why? Because it's normalized. Well, first of all, I might have been drugged or under the influence, but he got into my mind, you see, and made me think that, okay, um, he brought somebody from work and made me uh, perform on him, that that's normal or that that was my idea. I'm manipulating your psychology so I can have my way in other areas of life. This is a dominant one. 90% of those victims admit to sexual violence once they are engaged in DV counseling because then they learn about the definition, they learn about the manipulation and they go, oh, I, thought I, was, I thought I was trying harder, I thought I was being a good wife, I thought I was trying to spice things up because a lot of times we have these erroneous connections that sex equals love and it does not. And so that erroneous understanding comes out once we've established trust in the counseling relationship. And this is a big and important factor. Now, a lot of our victims are not only forced. Now, this is where we're bringing it in. Sometimes the children, okay, are in the room. 
and that offender doesn't care. And that's further humiliating, and it's, it leaves that mother guilt-ridden. And so, okay, let's just do it. Let's get it over with because I want to get the kid out. So there's a lot of manipulation in this arena, and this is horrific. And th this is stuff that hurts the spirit. This is, this is stuff that's hard to heal from. This is the stuff where, yes, we need to have that DV education. We need to understand how we got into it. We need to understand coping strategies, triggers, and all of that. And then we're probably going to need to do that a few times, and then we're probably going to need to move into some therapy, but not before we get that education. We have to have that education. It's imperative. Here's one thing that has been happening since the beginning of time, but we're seeing such a, an increase of, in, in this in the last five years, and that is forced impregnation. It's commonly used, but it's overlooked a lot. And this is a common use uh, a tactic by abusers. And so this really made a lot of sense to CPS because one of CPS's complaints was, why she got so many kids by so many guys? What this is wrong with her? Well, did you ever think she, it wasn't part of her choice? It's not her choice. Especially if I've gotten into your mind, especially if I'm dropping something in your drink, especially if I normalize it, especially if you're second, third, or fourth generation DV victim, then it's really normalized. And then if I've had any other experiences in my life, I might minimize it. But this is something we need to pay attention to because, as Elaine said earlier, if this is impacting the mom and she's the primary caregiver, then this is impacting the children. And as well, abusers will use the children. They will put them in the incident, in the event, so that it further cuts down on that psychology of that mom. And she will do anything then to move through that experience. Yes. Okay, Mika's bringing up a really good point, and that is this. Sometimes a woman gets into the belief system that, okay, if I get pregnant, this abuse will stop. And it's actually the opposite. We see abuse start to escalate because now um, I have to have power and control not over her, but also that baby. And I know, Elaine, you want to chime in on this. But it doesn't stop. There's a great uh, degree of jealousy. We think about that one case that we had out of Modesto. Uh, what was that name? Remember that? Um, Lacey. Peterson, yes, she was. That was domestic violence. Now you noticed in the media we didn't call that domestic violence towards, except for towards the end when he's in prison. Now we're coming back and going, well, yeah, I think that could have been domestic violence. It was domestic violence all over it, and he was jealous, and that didn't fit his lifestyle, so he had to take care of that. But this is a that's a really good point, Mika. So when we are also doing this training for CPS and in, and speaking about, remember that spousal rape, marital rape was not against the law until 1993, right? So I have a 37-year-old daughter who is a result of spousal rape, but she was born in 1977, right? And so when I sit in group with women and we're talking about this, what I'm saying to them is, all right, so just kind of get back into that space, right? Could you have said no freely without any fear of consequence? And there's not one of us that could say, no, that's not true. We, sometimes we would initiate it just to get it over with. Sometimes we initiate because we're trying to control the situation. So sometimes we would initiate. Now, what's the bad side of that? When you get out, it's all your fault. Even you think you caused it. Even you think. That's what happens when your mind is not your own. And that's one of the biggest reasons why we bring this back to knowledge is power. First thing victims and survivors need is knowledge. This is not a marital issue. This is a social issue. and you got to get this part. And once you get this part, the rest of it all makes sense. Yes, ma'am. The question is, how likely is it that a married woman will report this to law enforcement? Highly unlikely that she will. 
it is the most underreported crime. Um, sexual assault in relationships is the most underreported. It's already the most underreported crime, just generally speaking, and then it's very underreported inside of uh, relationships. Okay. Uh, did you? I'm just. I, I think we need to move kind of. Let's just go to this so we can set up a stretch and then Dave. Uh, domestic. Okay. Domestic violence is not an event, it's repeated incidences incidents. Uh, that equals a pattern and this is very important. That pattern creates a change in your personality. So the environment and your personality are all becoming um, a lifestyle now for you. So instead of having something of like, well, I'm really angry about something, you become an angry person. Instead of being sad about something, you become depression. So this is not just um, staying with one person, okay, because she's the target. This impacts the environment, and you need to understand that. So if you quickly think about a house, you know, like today was kind of foggy out. You think about a house, and there's fog on the inside. So you go inside. How can you not be impacted? Think about that kid. How can you not be impacted? And then when you leave the house, because you're immersed in that environment, when you leave that house, you're like pig pen from peanuts. You got that little dirt aura all over you. You are impacted. And so that's what we need to remember about this issue. So we want to highlight this last part about victim response and survivor coping strategies, mostly because that's all you ever meet. That's all you're ever talking about. That's all you're ever going to see. You're never going to get the real, the, hu the human being, okay, that's underneath all this. But it's also what's happening with the child. So the child is also learning coping strategies, right? Because if we're going to learn abuse tactics, we're also going to learn coping strategies. So let's just go like this. Everybody can understand this. So look, remember, everybody's had trauma in their life. You know, you don't have to name it out loud, but, you know, whether it's a loss of somebody, a death in the family, a sudden illness, loss of a job, breakup in a relationship, it's trauma, right? So when we're in trauma, we do stuff to cope with it. Some of us go shopping. Some of us like need that extra drink. Some of us go over exercise. You know, some of us eat, you know. Um, we do things, correct? And those are all okay things for us to do because after that period of time of trauma is done, we kind of go back to kind of how it was, right? We're not quite as focused about things. Even when we have trauma like that and we're in that space of that, and if someone were to say to you, you know, how are you doing? and you don't want to talk about it, what are you going to say? I'm fine. Which is not a truth, correct? Right, let's just call it out. That's a lie. Let's call it out. Because we often say to victims, why are they lying? Because they're in a coping strategy and maybe don't want to talk about it, just like you didn't want to talk about it when you were in your trauma. Hello? All right, so here's the deal. So if I'm in trauma as a survivor of violence in this environment, all right, here's the difference. It doesn't go back to normal. It's every day. So what happens if I am taking that extra drink and it's every day? Pretty soon, I'm taking that drink every day. Pretty soon, that drink starts owning me. It's very easy to get into addictions from that place when your trauma doesn't ever end. Does that make sense? So if I am, if anger works to keep people away, then I'm just going to stay friggin' angry, right? Because it works. I'll keep you away. It keeps you from asking me stuff. So if I'm just like, and everybody's like, well, Elaine's just so pissed off all the time. Don't talk to her. Hey, didn't that work for me? Works out good because I don't want to talk to you. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm going to use whatever coping strategies. Now, here's the deal. When I am a survivor, those coping strategies, because my, my, my trauma does not end, it's constant. And I want you to understand something. Women die when they leave, not when they stay. Why? Because the object of power and control is gone. And somebody who has power and control on Tuesday does not wake up on Tuesday and say, you know I'm thinking I have too much power and control. And I was just getting this epiphany this morning that I should share some of my power and control. No, people who have power and control wake up on Tuesday saying, how can I have some more and who's going to take it from me? Right? So the same thing happens. So that's why that, that, that we, <laughs> survivors are even afraid of being happy. We have a happy phobia even though we pray for it. Because once we get it, we're like, I don't know. Is it going to stay? All right? So that coping strategy becomes 
a, a lifestyle becomes part of your personality. We call it risky behavior, right? That's called how you live in a war zone. Now, if I see that the way my mother copes is doing this by self-medicating, hey, it's not a joy living in a war zone. I'm going to start to self-medicate as soon as I can. As soon as I have access, I'm going to start to do that. Right? If I see that um, blowing up and bullying other, uh, my mom works, I'm going to start going to school and I'm going to start doing that there. That's a coping strategy. If I am in denial because what problem, then you don't have to be stressed, then I start getting in denial about a lot of things. If I minimize things in this war zone and it works, it helps me not suffer so much, I'm going to minimize everything else. So I'm just going to tell you that, you know, he only kind of hit me. And so what I'm going to tell that law enforcement officer who's arriving on scene is that, no, I'm not afraid. When inside I'm shaking. But I don't want to tell you I'm afraid because I know you're not going to do anything about it. Because he already told me. You're not going to do anything about it. See, what you understand is the power and control of having the mind. The first thing you have to do to a victim is make sure she knows there is no help. Law enforcement will never respond to you. CPS is only going to take our kid. That preacher is going to make us get split up. We're not going to marital counsel. We've had a couple come into our office, right? And normally when we see, and we do work with men, but when they come in together and I'm like, no, we put you over here with the male counselor and you over here. Uh-uh, he's going everywhere she's going. Well, we know we can't do anything there, right? All right. So that coping strategy that's learned by that survivor victim is a lifestyle. And it sets them up to be re-victimized over and over and over again. Because if you're dissociated and you're in denial and you're medicated, right? A, you're much easier to control. And B, you are lacking awareness in your environment and you're lacking awareness of how you're being set up, you're lacking awareness of how you're being manipulated, right? And then the other thing that ends up with all of this is this very deep core belief that the world is against you. And as soon as the abuser gets you to believe that, and the only person you can depend on is that abuser, then I have ultimate power and control over you. And you are not going to do anything that jeopardizes this, it's us against the world place. Does that make sense? So when you're dealing with victims, not some of you won't ever have to see a victim, but if you are, you don't get to see that person. You're not dealing with that human being. You're dealing with a coping strategy that is an, 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 an environment that has totally changed that person's personality. And so that's why we say, uh, why are they lying? Why are they taking it back? Why are they doing this? Well, I can tell you this, too, just as a Trump being trauma-informed. As soon as a survivor tells you the truth, makes themselves vulnerable, self-discloses, two days later, we're freaking out about that truth because what are you going to do with it? Are you going to use it against us? Because that's the experience in the relationship. Where were you? Where were you? Where were you? I just went to the store. What did you get? Why did you get that? Why did it take you so long? Because the line was long, right? But if I say something else that's a complete lie and you buy it and it buys me safety, then I figure out lying kind of works. I went to see your mother. She wasn't home. I wanted to drop off the thing that you wanted me to. That worked. Lying works. Note to self. Does it make sense? So I'm wanting you to understand that in the bigger picture of the impact of trauma on adults and that the child is learning that. Every one of those skills, every one of those techniques, that child is learning it, not just to cope, but that's the way you're supposed to be. That's what's normal. This is how families are. I swear to you, when I read Lenore Walker's book, The Battered Woman, which was the only domestic violence training we had back in 1981, in that first chapter, I said, oh, my God, it's my family. It's called something. All this time, I thought it was me. So that's the important part. 
let me let me just add in here. So for for you folks in the job and in the work that you do, let's say that you have a survivor, uh, a victim apply for your program. I, I want to just kind of bring this back around to a couple of things. That victim, because of her coping strategies, because of her environment, because of her lifestyle, she might have this viewpoint of your victim compensation. Write me a check. Where's my check? I need my check. Because uh, she's trying to control the situation, and I need my check, and I was a victim, and I ha it's my right to get a check. So why are you delaying me getting my check? Why are you making me going over here and over there and everywhere when I just need you to write me a check? It says here you're going to give me some money. I need a check. And then you're going to have other victim survivors who are going to um, have that same situation of using uh, the, the coping strategies and the victim mentality and things like that, we're going to think, okay, I applied, but you know what? Um, I, I don't know if they're, if they're going to think that I'm, um, if I'm good enough to get that money. So maybe I better, I'm not going to follow up. Or maybe I'll just let that go. Maybe I'll just sort of, you know, up, duck my head and kind of move on. Um, I don't know if I should follow through because then now I still, that abuser might be gone, but I have all of this psychology that he changed in me still going on. I'm now still with that same psychology. I'm questioning myself. So if I've applied and I'm not following through or you can't get a hold of me, I kind of went off because, well, maybe it's not fair that I get something because, you know, I did yell back. Or I did throw that cup that one time. Or my mom says we shouldn't use the system because I'm not really um, a victim and I was just, you know, that's what marriage is. So it's really about understanding that you're going to be dealing with, again, not just a whole complete human being like maybe you are in the way that you think in critical thinking skills. Their critical thinking skills are gone. They're in survivor skills. So that paperwork may be very incomplete, and it may be very uh, hard to understand. But this is where those victims are going to come from. You're going to get one of these two extremes that are like, give me my check. I want my check. It's my right. You don't understand what happened to me. And you're going to get those other ones that are like, well, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm good enough to get this, and I did yell back that one time. So these are some of the things that you're going to be dealing with directly, but it's all coming from this, the change in the psychology, those experiences. Those experiences stick with a victim, and especially if we go to some of those harsher physical abuses and sexual abuses, I, again, I want you to understand that that victim's life is forever changed, and yes, they can heal and they can reclaim, but that's a, a hard, long journey back. It really shifts their spirit. So as if you can ever give a little bit more compassion, a little bit more patience. And one of the things that really works is, you know, I understand. I want to help you. Tell me more if you ever get the chance to talk to them. Um, and I know that a big part of your job is dealing with police reports. So when Dave gets into that, he will talk about police reports. I think it's, um, this is take a moment here. We'll take a moment, right? Some of you might need to relieve yourselves. Back teeth floating. That's what my dad used to say, right? But I also want to before he gets into the children piece of it, if there are questions that you might have for me and Robin right here before we roll over there, then we want to answer those right now so that you can then direct them to Dave because he's going to scoot out of here before we're done and let him have his presentation. So are there questions or comments or thoughts or is this giving you some illumination about some cases you're working with or some things you might do? Anybody have a question? We are live streaming on YouTube right now, so anyone who's watching through YouTube, you can also live chat your questions. Not necessarily a question, but it's a comment to what Robin mentioned. Um, our program, basically, we have time frames, and I had never really thought until you consciously mentioned and made it aware that, you know, we're, we're saying, well, uh, we sent you the information, you're not responding, especially for those victims who their coping strategy has become, as you mentioned on the second comment, oh, well, maybe I'm not, you know, they're not going to take care of me, or I'm not good enough. And I don't know, um, I'm going to put myself out there, but um, in the sense that I don't know if our program really works in trying to capture that, you know. So maybe... Um, there's some processes that can be looked at 
And some of us are more proactive than others, but we also, the accountability of the timeliness, maybe there's some ways that that can be, um, you know, people becoming more sensitized, more aware due to these kind of trainings of how we can reach that gap. That's exactly the reason why we're doing trauma-informed and why everybody, even in our movement, on the domestic violence side of our movement, is a real big emphasis on trauma-informed. Because one of the things I was sharing with Mika at the very beginning is how, and you all remember from October, how memory is stored. If you go back to remembering what Sarah told us, it was the biggest picture that I really, that made my mind make sense, of post-it notes. When you have trauma, it's like throwing up a stack of post-it notes, and that's how your memory is stored. And as a survivor, we're also good at hiding stuff. So we, we tuck this memory over here so it would be safekeeping, so, but then we forgot where it was. And when it comes back, we don't retrieve the memory in the same order that the event happened in. Right. So what we've learned to do in our shelter is, and with our staff when they come in, and if Robin, if you want to add any more to this, you can, but it's essentially an our trauma-informed thing is understanding that how they're going to retrieve their memory is not going to be in one interview. And so we have the initial intake interview, and they're in crisis. They're going to tell you the main points that's there. But if you wait three more days, four more days, there's some more. If you wait four more days, there's some more. It takes us 10 days for somebody in shelter for you to start to get the picture because as safety happens, memory comes back. Yeah. As safety happens. Let me add this in because I know that you work with police reports. And so, again, if we take what Elaine is saying about the post-it notes, if I have trauma and let's say I have that marked 1 through 50 on the post-it notes, then the trauma throws those post-it notes in the air. And I may only retrieve 12 and 16 and 3. But when law enforcement comes, they want it to be sequential. What first happened? Well, what did you say? I don't know. I can't remember. Okay, well, let's move on. Oh, and he did this and then that. Well, you said that you were over here then. Okay, yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, now you don't seem like a good, uh, a good victim here. And, and victims get this from law enforcement all the time. Law enforcement needs certain things. They want to write their reports, but also, too, and Dave will tell you, they want to close the, the scene and they want to roll on. Um, fortunately, law enforcement is being much more responsive to the issue. But during that interview, the very thing that's going to generate the report, okay, if, if that victim is in trauma, and she is because there's cops in her house or there's cops on scene, where are my kids? I'm trying to keep an eye on my kid while the cops need to talk to me. The cop needs my ID. Where's my ID? He took it. He stole it. Or it's, i got to go find it in the garbage in the bedroom. And so scenes are very, very chaotic. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of people need information from them. They were just traumatized. They don't know which way is up. I think that's in part why our program is successful because then we have that DV counselor there facilitating a rhythm, facilitating a right time and place to interview her or him and get that information. But you need to understand is that cops need certain information. We'd like they'd like it to be sequential and it never is. So sometimes that that report has its Swiss cheese. Hmm? And sometimes it's it, it's not a lot or it's not enough. And so that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. That doesn't mean that there was not a victim. It has a lot to do with how that victim presents to law enforcement. And it has a lot to do with law enforcement's comprehensive understanding of the issue. So that's one of the reasons why this kind of training is important. And remember, it's a new part of the movement, right? Right. Let's, let's stretch it out a little bit yeah, to stand get up some and breathe. blood moving before Dave comes up. Come on, you guys, go ahead and stand up. If you want to step follow along. Step and breathe, along. too.
on. Um, you heard his intro at the very beginning, and I know he has some things he needs to do. Dave is a, a, just a dear, dear human being and, and a great brother to both Robin and I and a, just a, a valuable asset to our team. So he, he has his background here in, uh, in looking at the impact of domestic violence on children as part of this. So I'm just going to turn it over to him. And we want to leave space for you to ask him specific questions before you ask me and Robin because he has to leave before the two of us. All right? So, Dave, take her away. You know, you are all on YouTube doing this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Sh you didn't see me doing that. I'm over there going, I'm not doing that stuff. Go home tonight. I thought you were in training. What you doing this stuff for? I don't, know, I don't look like you're in training. Crazy. Hi. Good morning. It's okay to talk. Me. It's okay to ask questions at any time. It's okay to raise your hand. You can even throw something soft at me, and I'll respond. Um, as Mika said earlier, I have been in law enforcement now for almost 36 years. Uh, it's been a terrific career. Um, for a number of years, uh, between 2003 and 2008, for SAC PD, I was a detective sergeant, and I supervised the Family Abuse Unit, uh, is where I co-founded the Sacramento Domestic Violence Prevention Collaboration and met uh, so many wonderful people like Mika and Elaine and Robin and others with this passion to involve themselves in this um, social issue that we call domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Um, and recently, in 2013, I was hired by the Citrus Heights Police Department. I'm a reserve officer there now. Uh, my role is to co-coordinate a grant on children exposed to domestic violence. So I work with our partners, which are ACFP, Committee for Peace, and Sacramento County CPS. And the three of us, um, the three agencies, systemically uh, improve in any way possible the way we respond to, investigate, report, uh, follow up on, deliver services to uh, victims and children of domestic violence. Uh, and um, this is why I'm working so closely with Elaine and, and Robin and CPS. So one of the things that we do uh, quite frequently is, is training. Um, training law enforcement, training CPS, uh, and even continuing training in the, the uh, area of advocacy as well. <clears throat> apologize, I don't have a, a podium, so I'll, I'll be turning every once in a while to look at my notes. Um, I wanted to start with this, this slide, um, and then I, I, I'll go through a couple of slides, talk about the nature of children exposed to domestic violence, come back to this slide. Well, there's so much information that we'd like to share with you today. Obviously, we don't have the time to, to deliver a real comprehensive approach to DV. We understand that your role is rather specific when it comes to uh, domestic violence and, and family violence and even um, your interaction with police and advocacy. Uh, agencies. Well, we're hoping that this this basic primer that, um, if you will, we're delivering, presenting this morning, will give you something that you can glean from in order to help you specifically uh, in your role, uh, professionally and maybe even your personal life as well. So, if we can do that, um, then this will be a success. Uh, Dr. Bruce Perry uh, was a terrific resource for understanding how trauma and exposure to violence affects the developing brain uh, said in 2003 that in some respects neglect is more toxic long-term than physical trauma. And, and this is uh, important because many of us in CPS advocacy and I think in your role as well, you look at domestic violence as an incident. In law enforcement, we're trained to look at domestic violence as an incident. So domestic violence is, from a law enforcement perspective, an assault or an attempted assault. Yeah, sometimes it can be criminal threats or a violation of a restraining order, but typically that's precipitated by an assault. So we'll get to a scene and we'll ask, did he hit you? 
And if so, what's the evidence to support that? Is there a mark? Are there bruises? Um, any witnesses? And I'll do my investigation. And take somebody to jail, write a report, the report goes to the DA's office, and the district attorney decides whether or not they're going to file charges or drop, the, uh, not file charges. That's pretty much the nature of what we do. Uh, uh, Robin alluded to this a few minutes ago, then we move on to the next case. When it comes to children involved or exposed to domestic violence, it's not necessarily about a particular incident and I'll get to the slide in a few minutes. The idea of children exposed to domestic violence is one of an environment that the kids live with on a regular basis. It's not as quantitative as responding to an incident. Okay, did he hit you? Yes or no? I can investigate that. I can measure that quantitatively. Well, when I'm investigating the role of children within a domestic violence family, it's more qualitative. And many of these questions here, some are based on my experiences, some are based on the research, are some of the ways that we assess the environment that children live in. Uh, are they afraid? Are they scared? Sometimes police reports will say child says they were scared. One of the things that we're trying to get our officers to do is to say scared of what? What would happen if we weren't here right now? What are you afraid of? We want to clarify, we want to expand, we want to elucidate this environment. We want to paint the picture. We want to show the colors and the textures that these children have to live in. Do you feel safe? Why or why not? Has anybody in your family been hit? Have you been threatened? How do you sleep at night? I'll talk in a few minutes about this um, element of, of exposure. Um, is there a safe place for you? Where do you feel safe? Has anybody called you names? Do you hear anybody else calling somebody else names? Sometimes children will hear names, profanity, and they have no idea what these words are, but they can repeat them. Um, I talked to a 14-year-old not too long ago who wrote them out because he was embarrassed to, to tell me the names that he hears his mom being called on a regular basis. And just that narration in my police report helped the judge decide that primary custody was going to go to her. And um, also, because he had um, taken all the money out of their joint account, he needed to pay a little bit of child support to help her pay the rent, because he was using some of these other qualitative means of controlling her rather than uh, overt physical abuse. How do you deal with non-structured time? Do you read? Do you play? Do you have friends? Uh, how, is, how do you like school? Uh, weapons. Have you heard anybody talk about weapons? Guns, knives. Um, have you seen any weapons? Um, what do you do when you get angry? How are you punished? Uh, friends, peers. I'll talk about the nature of interaction with society as well. How do you sleep at night? Um, yelling, screaming. How often? Uh, the idea of the environment that kids are exposed to is so important as a mindset versus the incident that sometimes we, um, we attach to domestic violence. Let me digress for a minute. In 2000-2005, uh, um, I facilitated a grief recovery support group. And I worked with some wonderful people who lost loved ones. And many times they would ask, when am I going to feel normal again? When I'm, and am, I, am I going to just get back to my, my old routine? And I would facilitate discussions on what life meant um, in light of the grief and loss that they had experienced. Let me ask you, and you don't have to disclose or raise your hands, but if you want to, how many of us in this room have lost loved ones? Okay. How long did it take you to get over it? Uh, what? Get over it? Still working on it, absolutely. And it, sometimes it's one of the biggest barriers in marriages and also in family relationships because other people expect you to be over it by now, don't they? Uh, husbands, wives, family members, brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, and uncles, you should be over it by now. It's been three years. Get on with your life. And this is a mistake we make in approaching domestic violence as well as we project on other people how they should be handling coping with a violent environment, even with children. 
how many therapy sessions does it take to get over it? I'll talk more about uh, the, the it that we're referring to exposed to domestic violence. But the idea of getting over it is so important because when we expect victims to get over it or to cooperate or to stop minimizing or to be truthful, we're projecting our expectations on them. And it's no different than somebody telling you to get over your loss. We, have, we can't do that. We have to learn to be non-judgmental. You hear Robin and Elaine talk about the trauma-informed perspective. The primary uh, basis for the trauma-informed perspective is understanding how that trauma affects somebody else, not how it would affect you. you know? And so it's wrong to project uh, on somebody else how they should be coping with a violent environment especially uh, children as well. There's no evidence to suggest that your brain and their brain are anything alike. And so this is a good place to start. Okay, so this is it. This is the, um, this is the exposure to violence. And I refer to this as the pillow effect. That's not a clinical term. Uh, this is my uh, my term. And the image I want you to um, have in your mind's eye as a child trying to sleep at night, wrapping that pillow around their ears to, to drown out the sound of the arguing, of the yelling, uh, of the things that go bump in the night. Um, be, many times we'll see in police reports or we'll talk to victims and they'll tell us that the, it was just an argument, right? How many times have you seen that in police reports? One of the things we're trying to address in preliminary investigations is to get past that argument. What does an argument mean? What does verbal only mean? Because this is what's affecting the children. As they have that pillow wrapped around their head, they're putting images to things that go bump in the night. And when children are young, the horrific uh, delusional images can be more disruptive and tra traumatic than the what's actually occurring. I could role play for you up here or on the side of the room, two people arguing. You have two actors and maybe profanity back and forth, it's getting loud and I could be up here saying, okay, pay, pay attention, okay, we have some things to talk about up here, uh, but yet they're arguing. You can look over, you can see, well, they're not physically involved, but for some reason they're in an argument, it's disruptive, but I can take that argument and put it out in the hallway. Now you don't know what's going on. And I'm asking you to pay attention to me, and you're listening to this argument out of the hallway, what kind of images will be coming to your mind? Okay, so the thoughts of what, what, what may be occurring relative to this argument may not be accurate. They could be very horrific. They could be delusional. They could be fantasy-oriented because this is how children's brains work. One of the... Um, most common words that come up in the literature when I was researching this uh, environment of children exposed to domestic violence is the word chaos. And it's important not to glance over the importance of this word chaos. Uh, when we study the developing brain and Dr. Bruce Perry and Dr. Siegel uh, are excellent resources for understanding how this works. Uh, we have to understand that the brain we're born with is a primal brain. We're born in a fight or flight situation. Uh, Dr. Kate Messina here in Sacramento refers to this brain as a reptilian brain. We, 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 we're scared. We don't know where we're at. We don't. If, imagine, if you will, and Dr. Messina does this so well, you go to sleep at night, you wake up tomorrow morning, and you're on a, a different planet. Literally, you're somewhere else. You've never been on this planet before, and there's a green person standing next to you. Imagine how you would feel. You're in fight or flight. The green person looks over, puts their hand uh, on, your, on your shoulder, and smiles. Your brain picks up on this, just like the infant's brain picks up on certain things that that brain needs in order to develop healthy neural pathways to higher cognitive functioning. That our brains need attachment, they need a smile, and if you doubt this, research the still face experiment. You can find that on YouTube and see what happens to an infant when the parent refuses to respond to them for just 60 seconds. 
We need the stimulation. We need the smile. We need the, the touch. We need the attachment. We need um, pattern rhythmic soothing. What do we do when our infants are upset? We soothe them. We rock them. We sing to them. We have poetry. This is common in many cultures, and it has been, according to Dr. Perry, for thousands of years. So we need the attachment. We need love. We need pattern, uh, ryth pattern rhythmic soothing. Uh, we need to feel warm, uh, fed, comfortable. And when we do, we can then look around us and explore the world around us. As we do, we develop healthy neural pathways to higher cognitive functioning. We develop critical thinking skills. We can compare and contrast. We can think for ourselves. Um, if we stay in a state of fight or flight, how do you think our brain develops? We develop neural pathways to, to higher cognitive functioning, but it's maladaptive. So these neural pathways tell us, as Elaine was telling uh, say, suggesting a few minutes ago, we're starting to pick up on nonverbal cues because that's the threat I'm exposed to on a regular basis. I'm not listening to what you're saying. I'm looking at your eyes. I'm looking at the frown. I'm looking at your body language. Maybe you're a teacher. I'm not listening to what you're saying because I don't like the threat that I perceive, even though no threat is present. Some of these children will pick up on threats when there are no threats present, but they'll see that threat, they get become hypervigilant, and they're in a state of fight or flight. This is the idea of understanding what chaos is compared to what we need as, um, as infants, as uh, toddlers and adolescents. Chaos is a lack of the pattern soothing rhythmic attachment that we need. It's disordered, unpredictable, disruptive. It's inconsistent and impulsive. It's violent, threatening. There's profanity, screaming, terrorizing, life threatening. We feel powerless as children. Uh, we cannot sometimes help or rescue siblings or parents. I'll talk more about this in a few minutes. We feel abandoned and isolated. Uh, everything around us is blaming, it's accusatory, degrading, rejecting, disrespectful. Uh, there's shame, uh, uh, self-esteem issues. Uh, it's distrustful, judgmental, hateful, suspicious, negative. We feel violated. It's manipulative, dishonest, expletive. Uh, role confusion. I don't know what my role is. You heard Elaine mention this a few minutes ago. What's my role as a child growing up in domestic violence? Am I supposed to help my sister, help my mom? Um, my dad keeps calling my mom crazy. Maybe she is. She's not helping us. I don't know. Should I? Do, who do I listen to? Who do I trust? Uh, avoidant, ambivalent, attachment disorders. Uh, when my parents are gone, I miss them because I want a role model, but when they're there, I don't want to have anything to do with them because they scare me. What's my role? What's my role? How do I define my role as a person and how do I find my role within the micro society or later on as I grew up, the uh, macro society that I'm a part of? Uh, accusatory, confrontational, aggressive, uh, emotionally responses so that when I'm in fight or flight, uh, the fight or flight mode is, is designed to be emotionally responsive, reactive. Okay, so I can, I can run or I can fight. I have to do that right now, even when the per, I perceive a threat that really isn't there for most people. Uh, this, is, this is a chaotic environment. Going back to that image I asked you to think about in terms of grief and loss a few minutes ago, how long does it take a child to get over this? A couple of things that uh, Dr. Geffner suggests we look at is um, severity. How severe is this environment, um, how frequency, how often does it occur? Uh, think about this, if you will. Um, I'm in school, 12 years old. It's Friday, and I'm not paying attention to what the teacher is saying because I'm thinking I know what happens on Friday night when Dad gets home. And then I know what um, I have to deal with Saturday. I'm, I'm helping Mom. Uh, maybe it, you know there's some bruising, maybe some cuts. Uh, maybe my sister's locked herself in the uh, the uh, uh, bedroom again. Sunday, it, it's just that everything is is horrible and everybody's crying. Monday, I can deal with, but right now it's Friday and I'm thinking about how I'm going to cope through the weekend. And now the teacher's getting aggressive with me because I'm zoning out and I'm not paying attention. Now I'm picking up on the threat that I perceive from this aggressive teacher. Severity, frequency, 
age is also very important. Research has shown that the older the children are, the more likely they are to get involved in intervening in the violence and the argument. Um, nine years old, 10 years old, 12 years old is when we start to see some involvement, maybe physically or maybe getting on the phone and calling 911. Also, the age of an infant. Do we ignore the fact that there's an eight-month-old in the crib in the same room where mom and dad are going at it? Again, the developing brain. Okay, developing healthy neural pathways to higher cognitive functioning begins at birth. And now it's not up, it's not up to us to, you know, we, we, we talk to police officers, you don't have, we don't have to show we're not experts. We don't have to show definitively that there's mental suffering or trauma within a developing brain, but we have to elucidate this environment so that in court an expert can say, based on this police report, that child has suffered some, uh, some trauma. So that's what the jury would hear. Uh, this is why it's so important to understand the qualitative nature of exposure to violence as a child in this environment that we're talking about. Also, just being exposed to domestic violence is a risk factor for other um, associated trauma. So research has shown that when adults were interviewed who have been exposed to domestic violence as children, 59% they had also said they also been exposed to substance abuse, 41% uh, sexual abuse, 38, 34% mental illness, psychological abuse, and physical abuse, 31%. Uh, Therefore, domestic violence just on its own is a significant predictor of child physical and emotional abuse and neglect. This is the difference between the incident and the environment uh, from a law enforcement's perspective. And, and, and trying to imagine what's going through your mind right now because I know you look at police reports. Um, I can tell you that we've come a long way. I wish I could talk to you about the history of law enforcement's involvement in domestic violence. It's not flattering, but it's very interesting. Uh, it, it, it does show that we've come an awful long way. And, 35 years. We still have a long ways to go. And one of the things I'm most proud about in Citrus Heights is that we have this divert team where our divert officers are highly trained. They work with the divert advocates. We have continuing training. In fact, we have training um, this afternoon at noon for two hours, and we do this every other month with our divert team to understand the implications and intricacies of domestic violence. So I know that when our divert officers go out to a scene and a child's involved, I know that report is going to be much more comprehensive than we typically see at Citrus Heights. We see a lot of information that paints this picture of this environment. We have to do that because it goes beyond just an incident. When we're reporting that children are involved in domestic violence as a criminal act, we have to develop a comprehensive picture so that expert then can go to court and say, based on this nice report, this child's experienced some, some, some mental suffering, some trauma. It's a, it is affecting the way their brains are developing, absolutely. Uh, because when children are involved, it's more qualitative, qualitative assessment. Um, anybody who permits a child to suffer uh, mental or physical abuse uh, or if their health is endangered, see this is not just an incident, it's not just an assault or an attempted assault. It could be years, it could be weeks, it could be months. What kind of environment do these children live in? Dr. Bruce Perry said that maltreated and traumatized children for a variety of reasons tend to be more impulsive. They struggle developmentally and are awkward socially. They will age, but they won't develop. So now I want to talk about uh, some of the things that we see, especially at ACFP, some of the things they see in the children they, they interact with on a regular basis, some of the, the research, some of the literature in terms of um, identifying um, problematic behavior. Uh, I think I can give you a couple of pictures that will allow you to understand what this environment um, produces in terms of uh, associated behavior. Did you have your hand up? <clears throat> 
right? No. Socially, yes. <laughs> right here. <laughs> you, have to, you have to have the social part of it and from the survivor side of it. If you think about the domestic violence movement, you need to understand it was started by five survivors. This whole show that we're about, five survivors of domestic violence who didn't go to college. They just survived. So it starts on the grassroots sides of things, but I think Mika even said this before. You got to have training and policy and law, all of those, and social movement all have to move together to make that systemic change. So, you know, you are part of it. When you guys have issues and you're getting blocks and barriers with law enforcement or CPS or what you need to do to your job, you have to use your voice too because this is a brand spanking new thing we're all in. 81, remember? 93. It's all new. So we're all part of the change. So even every time we train, even for CPS, they're always going to identify policy or protocol changes that need to take place so we can do that. And if you're joining our voices as domestic violence advocates and law enforcement and children's advocates, we're going to make these changes. We totally do, and we can make them pretty darn quick. We can do that. But we need to know that it's not just the DV side of the house that says you need to do this. We need you to say it, and we need to do this. We need law enforcement to say it, and we need CPS to say it. Then that language will start to be in there. You betcha. And it, one, one of the things that we're, we're uh, integrating into our training in law enforcement and, and CPS is this idea um, of distinguishing between a primary and dominant aggressor. Because you've heard, what well, you've heard this presentation so far from uh, Elaine and Robin refers to a dominant aggressor, right? They're domineering. They control the other person. Isolation and control. Uh, a, a sexual, emotional, psychological, financial, spiritual, cultural, it's controlling. Like you said, sometimes it's, many times, mostly it's controlling before it becomes physical. Sometimes, in a case I recently followed up with, it was almost all controlling with very little physical. But there was a 14-year-old involved. All right, and you should have seen the mother's face when the 14-year-old told me that his mom was the puppet and dad was the puppeteer. Those were his words. Okay, and and you you better believe the judge read that you know the next week in, in family court. Uh, very important to identify this environment. Sometimes what the children can say, how they elucidate this picture goes beyond sometimes what the adult victim has the capability of saying uh, and for very uh, various reasons. So dominant aggressors are very important. We're seeing a trend, I believe anecdotally anyhow, of, well, in, in, I know in Citrus Heights we're seeing more women being arrested for domestic violence. And recently we are at an international conference and I, we spoke with people all over the nation who are seeing an increase in women being arrested for domestic violence. And we can only guess as to why this may be. There could be a number of reasons. But it doesn't change the way we still investigate cases. And sometimes we develop a mindset that well, she was arrested for domestic violence, therefore she's the dominant aggressor. We have to remember the difference between dominant aggressor and primary aggressor. Um, did, you, did you hear Robin talk to you about all the ways he can dominate her life? Psychologically, emotionally, sexually? Now, I'm using terms he and she because primarily this dominant aggressor is, is a male. It's very hard, I'm sorry, for women to dominate men like that. It does happen. We have seen cases of it, but it's very rare. So excuse me if I use these terms, but, but I think it's more accurate. It's, it's very difficult for a woman to become this dominant aggressor. Did you hear the way she talked about how the man can lower his voice and just put his hand on her, on her neck and dominate that way? <clears throat> what In that environment, what can the, the female victim control? What can she control in her life? She can try to control you, as Elaine said, but what else within this environment can she control? Her kids. She can control her kids so she can do try to dominate or control the behavior of the kids in a way that's uh, more hyperactive or hypervigilant than otherwise. There's, a, there's something I'm reaching for here. What's the only thing she can control? She can control when she gets beat. 
So she can become a primary aggressor in order to get beat right now because I don't want to get beat tomorrow. We got something to do tomorrow, and I want him to be back in the honeymoon phase, feel sorry, and be treating me like a sweetheart he really loves tomorrow. I'll go ahead and take the beating tonight. Or I don't want to get beat tonight. I'd rather get beat tomorrow. So I'll be nice tonight, but tomorrow I'm going to push his buttons. That's the reason why in our shelter business, uh, all of our advocates get Christmas off because we're going to have a good Christmas. It's Christmas night and the next day. See, we're going to have a good New Year's Eve, but New Year's morning, that's when we all get our shelter. So... I want you to understand that when he's saying we know how to precipitate an event because the pattern, we know when that's going to happen and domestic violence for survivors is semi-predictable. I would say pretty much we know when that thing is escalating. So you got to pop the bubble first so that there's a, an element psychologically that you controlled the situation. Remember that survivors always want to control the situation. And now how confusing would that be for a child if they're in that environment? <laughs> not only does mom not protect me, but what is she doing now? And the police get there and they just arrested mom. Well, what the message we're, we're presenting to law enforcement and CPS is that we have to investigate past the primary, what appears to be a primary aggression. Because if there's dominant aggression with this in the family system, then the primary, primary uh, aggression her pushing his buttons or throwing something at him or slapping him could be in a response to this dominant environment that she lives in. And it, if, that, if we investigate it and we don't see it, and I'm not, to, not to suggest that dominant aggression is, is present in every argument, in every relationship, but if we don't investigate it and it's there, then we've done a disservice to everybody. If we investigate it and, well, no, he's, he's, he works hard, he doesn't drink, he doesn't, he's not out carousing every other evening, uh, he doesn't like to cuss, um, this is sort of an isolated event, she lost her temper, she slapped in, she's going to go to jail, she's a, just a primary aggressor. But sometimes we lose that, we, that definition of the two become watered down. And so we have to understand that even if a woman is identified and arrested as an aggressor doesn't mean she's a dominant aggressor and we have to still investigate that. It can complicate issues. So here um, are a couple of ways that you can understand the how children react to the environment that they live in. So we've talked about the environment. You understand that exposure to violence can be just as traumatic, if not more so, than physical abuse. This is we, you understand the environment. This is the the result. This is the outcome. We talked about the 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 primal brain, the fight or flight, and what, what Dr. Bruce Perry, what Lane and Robin see on a more regular basis, and not, not that every child is going to fall into this category, and there's a number of reasons why children can, can become self-sufficient, but what we see on a more generalized basis is young boys becoming hypervigilant, becoming aggressive, especially as they age. They start to become more physical. Uh, they've lost the ability to think critically, to compare and contrast, to, to appreciate different perspectives. They're stuck in this learned behavior, and the only thing they can control now is responding to what they perceive as a threat. Many times young boys will pr respond physically. Okay, they will be diagnosed as conduct disorder or antisocial or bipolar. Um, they're hypervigilant. They're still in fight or flight. Uh, they pick up on nonverbal cues. They're emotionally reactive. That means they don't think, they don't contemplate the outcome of what they're doing. They're emotionally reactive. I see a threat and I respond to it. Um, sometimes uh, older boys will look back at the, the violence, if it's been long term, and when we're young as boys, there's not a lot we can do. We feel powerless. Okay? And so we get a sense of guilt later on that we didn't intervene. I should have protected my sister. I should have done something for my mom. I should have stood up to that SOB. And now that I'm getting older and I'm getting stronger and my hormones are kicking in, I'm not going to let that happen again. So it's very common to see young boys acting out in this self-centered and immature perspective. Um, 
immature is so important, self-centered is so important, because one of the elements of maturity is to see yourself in society as a third person, to, to, see, your, to see yourself in society as a part of society. If you look at uh, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay, you have food, shelter, and clothing, then we want to be part of something. We want to contribute and we want to be respected for our contribution. That's a sense of maturity. Um, to see that I'm a part of a group at school or in sports or music or some other gangs. I, I want to be a part of a group. I want to contribute and I want to be respected. This, this sense of maturity of belonging to and respecting the sense of society is so important to uh, our maturation, maturation as, um, as adolescents. And if we're stuck in fight or flight, we don't get there. We stay self-centered because I'm in food, clothing, and shelter. I'm emotionally reactive. I'm self-centered. So you're going to see when a few minutes ago when he, Dr. Perry, uh, his quote said, they age but they don't develop. That's what he meant. They don't develop that, that sense of maturation, that sense of society. They still say self-centered because they're in fight or flight. So you're talking to a 15-year-old that's still acting like a 9-year-old. Very common. The other side of this, and I call this a continuum because it goes back and forth, you can have, you can have components of each of these within a particular person. You can have none or you can have something in between. But the other end of this continuum, one is uh, isolation and um, detachment, dissociation. And Dr. Perry sees, and Elaine Robin can talk to you about the young girls who tend to detach. Um, the, the, the sense of vulnerability, the sense of a strong male figure is so overwhelming that portions of their brain just, just shut down. Uh, and they go into a safe place. And they stay there. And they become just detached. And as they get older, they become very good at detaching. In school, they may appear as slow or dumb, or developmentally disabled. Um, they lack, may see, be seen as lacking motivation. They can't follow instructions. Uh, of course, eating disorders on both sides, poor self-image, uh, slow in school, isolated, quiet, hard to engage. Um, and the idea of cutting, Dr. Bruce Perry talked about this briefly in, in my training. Um, you, you all know how um, opioids or opiate drugs affect you, the, the, the painkillers when you go in uh, for surgery, of course, or the Vicodin or the Percocet after surgeries or dental operations. You realize that, that pain medications, opiate, heroin, uh, morphine, and the semi-synthetic opiates not only relieve physical pain, but they relieve emotional pain as well. That's why we get addicted to them, because they feel great. Uh, you don't use drugs to feel worse than I feel now. I use drugs to feel better. So opiate drugs are important because they make you feel um, nothing. And and I've talked to, I work with a gal who's, gosh, she's 20 years clean and sober right now. She is a hardcore heroin addict. And when I used her in, in some of my um, presentations to law enforcement, she would talk about the physical pain, the anxiety and the depression, emotional, excuse me, the anxiety and depression that she grew up with being exposed to violence as a child. And the first time she tried heroin, she felt absolutely terrific. And she said, this is how most people feel on a regular basis. I want to feel like this all the time, heroin addict. So Dr. Perry says that in many situations, cutting produces a flood of neurohormones that attach to the opiate receptor sites in the brain. So he says it's not uncommon to see some of these people cut in order to provide, produce that flood in order to help with that detachment and zone out. Uh, on to, the, uh, to the left, the bottom left in the, in the box, Dr. Perry says, you will create an aff excuse me, affective climate, that's an emotional climate, uh, by the way you act. You project to the world and elicit from other people the things you have inside. So you can imagine this adolescent on the left, hypervigilant, always in fight or flight, emotionally reactive, looking for nonverbal cues. That's the thing, that's what they have inside. That's what they're projecting to society. They will re, society will in turn present to them an effective or emotional climate based on that. So you can imagine this cyclical nature of how they're going to not only 
react to the violence in their family system, but interact with society, the affect of climate that society presents to them, then the cycle continues. No wonder we have children who are 13, 14, 15 years old who come into ACFP or other advocacy agencies and have no clue what they're doing. Uh, and they still picking up on nonverbal cues, even in a healthy environment. The bottom right uh, box, um, and I thought this is so important, Dr. Perry says that fainting and referrals for seizure disorders are the most common ways that dissociative children end up within the public system. So that zoning out, detaching can be so pervasive that it mirrors seizure disorders. These are the two continuums. That doesn't mean that every child will fall into one of these categories. Dr. Geffner talks about a couple of things that are important for a child's ability to escape this environment. Uh, one is adaptability, and there's two components to that. One is an emotional adaptability, and the other one is an intellect. Uh, and some of these things are, are just genetic that they're born with. Coping skills, emotional IQ versus the intellect. You know, does a child, as as they grow, do they be do they have the ability to understand emotionally that things are not right? Can they compare and contrast? Can they see the larger world around them? Can see, they see themselves as a part of society? If they can, this adaptability will help them transcend this violence. Um, also, healthy role models in a child's life is very important. One of the number one things that can help pull a child out of a violent environment is a healthy role model. Primarily in the family system somewhere, primary or extended family system is important, but having a healthy role model is real important to allow that child to com compare and contrast. So not every child fits into one of these categories, but on a generalized research basis, these are the two ends of the continuum, and if you understand how this works, then you can understand anything in between. Uh, and Dr. Perry says that resilient children are not born, they are made. If you want to be, if you want to have healthy children, provide them with a healthy environment. If you want to have nice children, be nice to your children. Uh, you can see first impressions, uh, and we, we can't play it here for you, but it's on, it's on YouTube. So Mika can, can talk more about this, but First Impressions by Dr. Perry and Dr. Linda Chamberlain will talk about the developing brain and the effect of domestic violence on children. Uh, they're not born, they are made. Who's responsible for that? And then back to the original slide. So we, we, we talked about this nature of being exposed to um, domestic violence is more qualitative than quantitative. We talk about it, the importance of understanding the difference between the incident and the lifestyle or the environment. We discuss what that environment is and we talked about some of the problematic behavior that we see as a result of being exposed to that um, problematic environment. Uh, again, I know this is a lot of information. There's a lot more information that we could provide to you, but we're hoping that this, this, this flood of information can be enough for you to pick something out of, to glean something that can um, help you in your professional lives and even your personal lives as well. Dave, thank you so much for your time and expertise. I know you have to run off. Does anyone have a, a question or a comment before Dave scurries out? And plus, on, on YouTube, you can live chat, so do that. Okay, let's. Yeah, first question I have is, how long has the DVIRT program been around? How long has the DVIRT program? The DVIRT is the Domestic Violence Response Team. It's a unique program to the city of Citrus Heights. Uh, that was developed seven years ago. Um, uh, the original, the first response, this is Devert first response where we go on patrol. This was actually Elaine's idea. She presented it to Chief Boyd of the Citrus Heights Police Department. And uh, I think the, uh, a big reason why this works is because Chief Boyd has zero tolerance for domestic violence and he said, let's do it. And it took me about eight months to a year to develop the training and the program um, because there are so many rigorous 
hoops that these counselors must jump through in order to qualify uh, to get on the team because this is a this is a, a cutting edge and very progressive program so we wanted it to be successful our statistics show that it is st uh, successful but again these folks have to really uh, it's like they're going after their masters uh, they have to jump through a lot of hoops and understand it but a, a real big key too is that they must be psychologically and emotionally stable um, and be able to uh, respond in all situations because you're out there and it's a code three and um, oh they're pulling out their guns and so there's a lot of training on both sides and it's uh, it's also about sharing cultures um, our different viewpoints on this issue okay and in the seven years since the Deaver program has been in existence has any other law enforcement agencies approached your program with the possibility of bringing a divert program to their jurisdiction? Yes, sir. Uh, we're, we're working with SAC PD right now in um, taking our first steps. Uh, we are um, hoping that this will become a, a developed program within the uh, Family Justice Center here in Sacramento County. No one else that we are aware of nationally is doing this. However, I have been contacted and am consulting um, a DV provider in Ontario, Canada. And I think that they will be successful and the reason is is because the chief of police there initiated it and went to the provider. So really the, the turning point is the law enforcement. Will they let us in? Will they let us participate? Will they let us train them? And then they as well have to train us on culture because historically, um, this would have been done a lot earlier, but historically DV providers and law enforcement got along like mm, oil and water. Again, primarily because of that behavioral perspective versus that legal perspective. Okay, and one other question I have is, has anybody considered tracking, say, the families who Devert has touched to see how basically the families and the children have developed over the years as opposed to, say, DV families where Devert was not involved? Because what I'm getting at is once you get to the root of the problem and you start addressing domestic violence, there's all these other issues such as substance abuse, assaultive behaviors and whatnot that in that community it would greatly reduce the amount of all these other violations and criminal acts once you get to the root of the problem which is the culture that is being you know, brought forth from generation to generation. Yes, that's great insight and that's absolutely, and I'll hand that over to Dave because he's really our master uh, stat guy, but I can also say this is that one of the great things about the DVIRT program in uh, First Response in Citrus Heights is that, you know, uh, when we weren't responding to um, something that was directly connected to domestic violence, family violence, or sexual assault, we would roll up to say uh, smash and grab. And so when that, um, when that person is arrested, let's say, uh, we get an opportunity if we want to have a conversation with them and, and more times than not, maybe eight or nine times out of ten, we can trace that perpetrator back to family violence. So what you're saying is really accurate. Let me, let me, let me just add here before Dave goes here. Uh, you're so, you know, sidebar, you should think about volunteering, I'm just saying. <laughs> That's such a brilliant question. And then just before I answer the other part, to all the guys in here, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of this. And you don't know how powerful you can be in our movement. I can come to that later. But let me just say this to address you. When we start at DVIRT, because we tend to be people who are going to look holistically looking at this issue, right? So when we start DVIRT, you can't just go in here and stir up something if you're not going to have some place for people to fall, okay? So... We uh, have unlimited services at ACFP, and they're all free, and so you can come at any point in time in your life and journey and leave and come back and leave and come back. It's all fine. But we also created a JDEP program. We're the only one who has a, a juvenile diversion program in Citrus Heights. So if you are a juvenile and you get tagged with intimate partner violence, whether at school or something, this is the only crime that is never expunged from your record. Because if you do violence as a teen in your intimate partner um, relationships, you are 1,000% more likely to do it 
as an adult. And so these families are brought into the seat into the PD and they're given the thing and they'll write up the charges, but instead of filing them, they'll send them to us. And so what we're doing is we're taking that juvenile in the door, but our therapist brings the family with them so that the parents got to come in there too. Then after that, we said, well, wait a minute, what about all these little kids? So we have just opened the first trauma-informed preschool for children exposed to DV 2 to 5. And it's just a little pilot thing here that we're trying to try out here right now. So just to round out, you're correct. We know that research tells us that every acting out juvenile thing, the root cause is domestic violence. Now from data side, your matrix. Well, first of all, thank you. Great questions. Um, in terms of whether or not our approach is having an effect on other related crimes, I, I don't know. And I'm not so sure that those numbers would be um, present anyhow because I would think this may take a generation or two before we would start to see that. It would be a great longitudinal research um, for those of you in your PhD programs who would like to start studying this. Uh, but what, what we are seeing is a couple of things. Research has shown that one of the biggest predictors of safety for the victim and children is accepting resources and services like ACFP. Uh, so in the event police respond, we have uh, a list of risk factors. Jacqueline Campbell, 2002, was one of the first to produce risk factors. Any of these things present will indicate an increased risk of harm, or injury, or death to the victim and or children. So we're trying to recognize some of these risk factors. In addition to making an arrest, because that is one of the, the single biggest things we can do at the scene is to make an arrest. The second biggest thing that we can do to provide safety to that victim and children is getting her to accept services. And the sooner the better. The, when this DVERT program was first established, Robin determined that was it eight percent? About eight percent of the victims of citrus heights were accepting services. After five years of this DVERT program, where again, where our advocates are out with the officers working with those victims on scene, we're up to almost eighty percent. About seventy-two percent of the victims in citrus heights are accepting services. So we can show based on research that there's going to be a correlation between minimization of return calls for service and minimized um, incidents of increased injury uh, due to domestic violence just based on what we're doing here as a collaboration. And I think also over the course of this program, um, at the very beginning, we really did have the PD do a big huge analysis for us. So we knew the time of day, the day of week, the neighborhood, the particular complex that had the highest level of domestic violence. And one of the things I said to the chief is what you want to do is reduce the repeat incidences because it's the repeated incidences that are your lethality and homicide indicators. So I can tell you that in year number four the repeat incidences did start to go down in Citrus Heights. Although I did tell the PD it's going up first in your reporting and that's a good thing for DV survivors but it will go down on the repeat. So that's where we are right now but those are the fabulous questions. All right, I've got another question here. Thank you. What's the impact on children survivors as they become adults and the parent, the victim, leaves? I'll start. Uh, that's a great question. You know, if you remember uh, Dave's last couple of slides um, that talked about uh, aggressive behavior, isolated behavior, one of the things is, is that we need to understand is that these, these kids grow up and become part of that generational pattern. So if I am eight years old and let's say I'm living in that environment but then let's say that there's one incident that really stands out to me it's what Bruce Perry said is that I can age but I'm not going to develop so then as I grow up I might be 30 years old but emotionally I might be 12 and so that makes it very difficult to parent doesn't it because I don't really know how to parent so um, that's one of the things that I like to call out is that this is part of again that family cycle as well that this is that generational uh, pattern and this is why this is such an important 
issue for everyone in our culture to be aware of. Everyone needs to be involved. Everyone needs to say, hey, I identify something here. Hey, let's ask questions here. Because we are producing our future offenders and our future victims with these children in this environment. So we really need to be paying attention to that. So this perpetuates if we do not intervene, especially for the kids. Adult children, okay, because we do grow up. So adult children, first of all, remember we're learning stuff. Okay, and we're going to learn stuff from systems too. We're going to learn stuff from how systems respond. I can tell you that we have a lot of survivors that say, I'm the kid you took away. I'm the kid you removed. So do I have a bigger issue with CPS now? You betcha I do, right? Because now I got kids. And so I'm already deciding you're not something. The other part of it is if I'm being raised in this environment and this is my second generation and everything's all normal, then I learn to be as aggressive, I learn to be as manipulating because I'm only 13 years old still. Does that make sense? And the third thing I want you to understand though, it still can be changed. Last night in our advocate training, I had three adults who were... Um, who watched what was going on in their mothers, you know, with their moms growing up in this violent home. And this is all before the law in 1981. And each one of them, as a result of this knowledge from their DV training, went, actually went back and talked to their mothers. These are all adult women. And they went back to have a conversation with their mother this last week. And one young woman said to her mother was just giving her the information about domestic violence. And the mother was relieved of guilt. The mother said, oh my God, I didn't know this is what this was called. Another woman shared with us last night um, a similar thing that with her mother, right? Because now they understood. It was, you didn't have any resources before 1981. We get it. We understand. Now we thought you chose him over us. We didn't get you. were trying to keep us safe. This last woman who spoke last night was very amazing. And so her and her mom had been estranged because, you know, why didn't you leave, right? And then um, they had the conversation, and the mother said, oh, my God, you're at where? She said, a community for peace. She goes, their Devert team came to my home five years ago. And so there is that. Now, as a child whose mother never left, never left, you're left with this thing about him, her choosing him over you. And so you're left with this whole idea that there's never going to be someone who will stand for you, who will advocate for you, and you kind of have to do it yourself. So how does that translate to you? Well, I'm so not trusting you either. And there's not one dang thing you can tell me that I'm going to believe about you because I know that no one, and I don't have value and worth enough to be protected, to be supported, and to be helped. So those are some of the long-term things that happen, but the good news is if you give domestic violence education, even years later, it relieves that victim and survivor just to know what it's called and why it happened that way. Um, I'm going to add just a little bit onto that because I was just talking with Marlene over here. So back when I worked at Weave, twice a year we would do what they call DV sweeps. And law enforcement, CPS, advocates, sounds like maybe they still do this, would do a, a sweep of the county or the city and go into the homes of people who were on probation for domestic violence crimes. Okay, so we never really knew what we were walking into, what was going on. We'd walk in and see, you know, drugs out on the table, um, all, all kinds of interesting things. Um, so in this one particular case that I, I remember very clearly and has really s stuck in my, in my heart was a, a case where we walked into a, a home, an apartment, there was marijuana on the table, the, there were two little kids, infant, like a 10 month old and a 3 year old, fresh out of the bath, clean pajamas, clean, altogether clean, but the, the person who was on probation for domestic violence crime now had marijuana. So guess what that was? They violated their probation, okay? And he is an accused domestic violence batterer. So he was arrested. And imagine how those kids reacted as they saw their dad get cuffed and get arrested. They attached themselves to his body like glue. They were so they were so upset to see their dad get taken away, get arrested, even though they were exposed to high levels of chronic abuse 
Okay, lots of abuse in the home. That's why he was on probation. And then I, I, I started really thinking about this and looked into, and when I started working at the Child Abuse Prevention Center, um, runaway rates of, of youth in, in care who are removed from homes because the home is an unsafe environment. That's one reason why children are removed is due to safety. And the runaway rates are incredibly high. And where are they, where are they running to? Back to dad or back to mom, back to this home environment where we're thinking, oh my gosh, it's so volatile, it's so dangerous, it's so yucky, it's so abusive, why are you going back there? So I think that's part of, too, of what Marlene's asking about is children, we want them to be safe, we want to create this bubble of, of nurturing and love and security and safety around them, and ultimately they want to be with their parents, even their abusive parents. That's correct. I can uh, uh, validate that even as a child growing up, right? Because and I'm a firstborn child, so I also have a role in that family as a protector and as a defender of my siblings, but I'm the one who bandages her. I'm the one who takes care of her, and I got to know where he is all the time. So one of the reasons I want to be there is because I get to do the temperature check. I get to know what's going on. It's also one of the reasons why women go back because it's scarier for us to not know. Sort of like Dave talking about the, the argument in the hallway where your imagination is. So if I can have my enemies right here in front of me, which who I also happen to love, then I feel like my world is together. Out here, I don't know who you are and I don't know what you're going to do and I don't even know what to do with freedom. I do have no idea what to do with that kind of thing. So it's very, very convoluted in the way we think as children in that environment. Uh, I'll just quickly add is this is where we help uh, children get very confused um, with pleasure and pain. I'll just leave you with that. And I think we do a really good job at Cal VCP in making sure that these kids get the mental health that they need. You know, that's, that's one, I mean, we do a really great job in all kinds of areas, but really approving and making sure that those TPs and ATPs for kids are going forward because, like Elaine mentioned earlier, the brain of a child is a sponge. That's how we learn language so quickly. We just absorb it. We absorb everything in our environment. It's the babies, it's the infants, it's the toddlers who are the most vulnerable, right, because they are taking it all in. Any last comments or questions? Again, Bruce Perry, look him up on YouTube. Great 14-minute video. We are now showing it in AI and ED, uh, AI and ED training uh, to help to help demonstrate that. 15, 14, 15 minute training. One of the last things he says at the end, which uh, Dave mentioned, was if you want your child to be kind, be kind to your child. Right? So if you guys would please fill out your evaluations. Leave them with Matt on your way out. Thank you all so much for the honor.